one race, four categories, four winners. The principal of the Le Mans series, which this year again sees more than 40 cars running at the five European rounds, with as a bonus an overseas event on the mythical Brazilian circuit of Interlagos, a new year of ripening for the reigning discipline of endurance motorsport. It's a season full of promise kicking off for the Le Mans series. Numerous prototypes have come to reinforce the LMP1 contingent, and among them the official Peugeot 908s, making their grand debut in endurance, with the objective of preparing for the Le Mans 24-hour race. The Lions already dominate in qualifying, taking the leading positions in the opening round in Italy. Pedro Lamy just a few seconds ahead of Marc Chenet. But while the technological domination of the French prototypes is clear, they're not exempt from the odd teething problem, like a door that won't close properly. A door that also doesn't want to open during this battle for fifth place between the Charles Lola and the Pescarolo, outgoing champion. The contact provoked by Stefan Mucha also causes his demise. Starting last, the Pescarolo of Roll Center Racing is powering its way back up like a rocket into the top five before falling victim to this incident and being forced to retire. An all-French duel then between the Courage of Jean-Marc Gounon and the Pescarolo of Christophe Tinceau. The two teams are neighbors back home. The advantage goes to the blue car, taking fourth place. While the sister car is in for a change of drivers, it's Jean-Christophe Bouillon who passes the wheel to Emmanuel Collard in an orchestrated and impressive ballet. They'll keep second place right through to the end. The Peugeots are first and third with sights set on the finish line. Starting from pole, car number eight lost time in the details, but the other 908 had a clear run and offers Peugeot its first victory, ahead of the Pescarolos who don't leave luck to chance. Marc Chenet and Nicolas Manassian on the top step before taking their share of breakdowns. On the Valencia circuit, it's car number seven that becomes capricious, after a certain time taking it easy in the lead. Thanks by Nicolas Manassian to his team, give the signal to retire. Just like in Monza, the other 908 picks up the pieces. Three or four seconds faster than everyone else per lap, they leave no place for doubt and celebrate the second victory for Peugeot Sport in the Le Mans series. The cause was already decided for some time for the first place, but the battles that went on behind gave all the intensity to the event. A new phase in the Charus Pescarolo duel, for example, with Roland Dumas reinforcing his side and worries justified for the rear left end of the car from the south. Car number 16 is a collateral victim to a duel between Charus and Roll Center. Stefan Mucha against Joao Barbosa. One of the highlights of this second round of the season, which finishes, unfortunately, by a broken rear end for the private Pescarolo, which consequently won't make it to the checkered flag. <music> Team Arena arrive in Spain with their Zytec and their drivers, the Swede Johansson and the Japanese driver Shimoda, who animate the race and beget respect. The Swiss Spirit Lola also, constantly in the top five, finishing on an unexpected podium where the Pescarolos are absent, but where the Peugeot Ogre is again in the lead, thanks this time to Pedro Lamy and Stefan Sarazan. Things all go well for the Le Mans 24 hours. the two Peugeots in the leading positions, it's become a tradition by the third round in Germany. A thousand kilometers to run and just as many reasons to renounce. Endurance racing is not an exact science. The well-oiled machines of the 908 Duet have the advantage and it's at Pescarolo Sport that there's the first alert. Worrying smoke but no consequence on the progress of Emmanuel Collard towards the podium. On the other hand, Christophe Tinceau and Harold Prima head for the garage for a forced stop. 
and what can be said for Roll Center, who've seen more difficult situations. Decidedly, luck is not on the side of the French constructors, because it's the courage that's slowed down by this off-road sortie. This all goes to the advantage of the creation, running its first race of the 2007 season, rewarded with fifth place overall. In the pack, approaching the finish line, errors are still possible. The Chiruz Lolo, in its attempt to fight back, leaves a few feathers. The Czech car will finish the race fourth behind the Pescarolo number 16. And while there are problems for the team of Martin Short, Peugeot signs its first double header and third victory of the season with the team of Stefan Sarazin and Pedro Lamy, a French-Portuguese duo which confirms its position at the top of the championship. On the other hand, the other car of the team has also to deal with the determination of Henri Pescarolo, here to defend his title right to the end. Applause, scenes of joy and thanks, almost the routine in this 2007 Le Mans series, except that in motor racing, this word doesn't exist. No victory is easy, and that of Lamy and Sarazin, one more on the revised Spa-Francorchamps track, is no exception to this rule. For proof, the victorious 908 is the only one to make it to the finish. Its twin sister bites the dust in the 32nd lap, a new hard blow for Nicolas Manassian and Marc Genet, who'd started from their fourth consecutive pole position of the season. It's sure the Peugeot that started from pole was really flying from the start, which could have also been the case less figuratively for the Charouz Lola, surprised by the late breaking of Jonathan Cochet and his courage. Consequently, for car number 15, a full lap on its wheel rims and a pale 25th place at the finish. The outcome is somewhat similar for Team Arena, victims to an accident just as they've made it to the top five, off after one and a half hours racing. The luck at this point goes to the creation, with a good pedigree driven by Filippi Ortiz, Jamie Campbell-Walter and Shinji Nakano, heading for the steps of the podium. As for the Pescarolos, they're in good form here because they're among the four forerunners at halfway point. However, while the Roll Center cars hit with a starter problem, the two official cars will make it to the end of 5 hours and 48 minutes racing. Harold Prima and Christophe Tasso making it to the third place on the podium. Jean-Christophe Bouillon and Emmanuel Collard back to confirm that the cars of the Grand Henri will be there, whatever happens, to resist the hegemony of the Peugeots. The essence of motor racing. It's perhaps just this, in these relentless confrontations that finish in celebration. Furthermore, it's in full swing of the Rugby World Cup that the final European round of the season takes place, not far from the origins on English soil. And the Franco-British duel also turns to the advantage of creation. In any case, when it comes to the battle with number 17 of Christophe Tasso, who retires after 67 laps. Pescarolo again pays the price in this confrontation with the Team Charus Lola, who take advantage of a tail-ender to pass the car of Roll Center, which will nevertheless finish third, and a front washed away a little later in a duel that this time turns to the advantage of Emmanuel Collard. While his sad adversary is forced to announce immediately following this, to announce a word the teams don't like, but sometimes a fatality, the Chilton brothers and their Zytec paid to learn it. And the price is even higher for the championship leader's car, collapsed onto its left rear wheel rim. The tire also provokes quite a fright for Felipe Ortiz just behind. On the other hand, on the Peugeot number 8, the bodywork has to be repaired. The rules are clear. The 908 will still be there while the other team heads for a new triumph. Mark Jenner and Nicholas Manassian are slow to get to the podium, but it's a luxury accorded to the winners. The championship is played at Interlagos. With just two points gap, Pescarolo are still pretenders to the throne, but theory and practice are a thousand miles apart. And in practice, 
Peugeot offer themselves a royal double header along with the world title. Turning the clock back nine hours, one could still have had doubts on the outcome of the season with so many things and gears badly engaged for the Lion. Starting from pole position, it's the car of Sarazan and Lamy that takes a huge amount of time to launch out into the formation lap and will end up starting from behind the pack. The same car is forced into the pits with minor alerts while the other car at the hands of Nick Manassian and Marc Genet prances in the lead. Even though it was they who had been used to the bad luck in the Peugeot camp, this time nothing will hinder their impetus. Running slow but not stopped, the Pescarolo of Bouillon, Collard and Prima is forced to accept the evidence. The guards of endurance had turned their back on them. A broken suspension member causes the loss of valuable time and a possible place on the podium. While the title was difficult to defend for the Pescarolo team, it's now virtually out of reach. And while car number 16 is back on the track, it's once again to show they're willing to fight to the end without ever throwing in the towel. Opportunist, but not only that, Creation have come to confirm the major progress they've made since the Nürburgring. The British prototype has systematically been in the places at the finish since mid-season, and for the occasion of this final round, they even make it to the podium behind the two Peugeots, taking the title of best petrol-driven car of the race. Stefan Saraza and Pedro Lamy thus offer the 908 its first championship title, and this in its first year of competition. Ah, it's amazing, I'm so happy, so happy for, for all the team. We start uh, with a new car at the beginning of the season and uh, now we are champions, so it's amazing. I'm uh, very, very happy. Pedro putting in a, a fabulous uh, performance right through to the end in the dark very difficult conditions in, the, in this, this case. Yeah, sure, very difficult. It was a very long race and uh, we stopped a few times on the box just to be sure the car can uh, finish the race and uh, we achieved the target. We uh, finished first and second today and we are champions, so it's, uh, it's just uh, wonderful. LMP2 is a fast-growing category in international endurance racing and the Le Mans series doesn't escape the rule. Lola, Radical, Courage, Pescarolo and Zytec disputed the 2007 title during the six events on the program. For the opening round in Monza, it's the Portuguese team of ASM Kifel and Paul with their Lola. On the other hand, the 2006 champions, Team Barazzi Epsilon, are forced to start from the pits due to a last-minute technical hitch, just like the pill beam of Pierre Bruno and Marc Hostong. Very quickly, it's the winners of the 2006 Le Mans 24-hour race, Mike Newton and Tommy Erdos in the MG Lola of Ray Malik Limited, who take command of the race. There's an opposing trend in the radical camp. Firstly, it's Embassy who start having problems. This is followed almost immediately by Brook Laddie, who are forced into the pits on several occasions. The temperature of the Italian asphalt's 40 degrees and the Lola of Kifel ASM pays the price. A rear wheel straying under its wing puts paid to any hopes of an LMP2 podium finish. 
It's a surprise podium. The Zytec Lola of Bini Motorsport was discreet during the race, 23rd overall, but third in their category. They follow some distance behind the MG Lola of Team RML, who for a long time led the group, but had a number of reliability problems. They're finally forced to give way to the Lola Jod number 27 of Didier Tays, Eric van der Poel and Freddy Lehnhardt. The Swiss-Belgian team worked on preparations in the USA and are rewarded here for their efforts with victory. technical circuit of Valencia gives us a whole new partition. The LMP2s are up there with their big sisters in LMP1 on the grid. The fastest is Michael Verges at the wheel of the Barazzi Epsilon Zytec, but he quickly loses the benefit of his pole position. The first place doesn't remain vacant for long. The title holders power into the lead before falling victim to a new oil leak, letting victory slip away. Contrary to appearances, it's the ASM Lola that will get the upper hand of this bad patch, taking the race in the end. And the discreet courage of Sonia Racing, discreet but regularly in the top five of the class, finishing on the second step of the podium. Appearances can be deceptive. Proof of the fact the MG Lola of RML looks like it's running like clockwork, but don't be fooled, with a number of pit stops, they're a long way off the fight for victory. As for the winners of the first round of the season, they're heading directly for retirement. As we said, endurance is not an exact science. And it's not Pierre Bruno or Marc Rostand who would save the contrary. Entangled as they are in their chronic misfortune and technical problems, they also need courage to accept this retirement. Vitaly Petrov, who was leading the category until now, knows something about it. He who chose here to renounce a victory that could have been his. We find thus our trio, who we saw just a few moments ago in agony, finally at the top of their form. Bruce Juani, Jacques Nicolet and Alain Filol breathing down the necks of Amaral de Castro and Borguino, who are not able to be dislodged from their leading position, and who take, for two among them at least, a home victory. Radical, Courage and Lola on the podium. The promise of another hotly disputed championship this season. RML decidedly don't seem to be lucky at the moment. After conceding victory to Bini at Le Mans, things haven't been much better at the Le Mans series here, tangling with the role center Pescarolo. On the other hand, at Nürburgring, at the start of the race in any case, for the Radical of Team Embassy and the Gulf Zytec of Barazzi, Verges and OJ, who remain constantly on the virtual podium. For the Radical of Grease and Mosley, they're running hot in the first half of the race, both still defending a potential place among the top three. The Lawler of Tommy Hodos and Mike Newton finally didn't suffer too much in the tangle, and it's they who retain the lead and finish with a win after six hours racing. At Brooklady Racing, there's a dark cloud of a long series of problems engendering multiple pit stops and poor placing in the classification. For the first time, Barazzi Epsilon have avoided any major problems and are definitively installed in second position with the bad luck this time hitting Embassy, victims to the start of a fire in the pits. The elusive battle for second place animates the pack right till the end, finally going to the advantage of the blue prototype. But the big winner of the day is the Odos newton duo, who set themselves back in the saddle for the title. The team's able to breathe again after their hassles at the start of the season. This win also puts the team into first place on the LMP2 table, ahead of the Lolos of Kiefel ASM and the Horag Lister.
Spa Francorchamps is one of the great meetings of the season, one that no one wants to miss, but at the same time there has to be a winner, and playing towards perfection, it's again RML who shine with a pole position and the victory. The appetite for the British team has almost become greedy, and their lead in the championship grows. A flip sends the Zytec of Barassi and his teammates to the depths of the classification. And for them, the dark series is not over. Same cause, same punishment for the Lawler of the Belgians, Tace and Van der Poel, running with the Swiss driver, Freddy Lehnhardt. And despite all this, we find the two cars at the end of the race quite well placed. The Zytex battling with Kiefel ASM Lola, but in this knife fight there'll be two victims. The cars touch, Michael Verges goes off and provokes the elimination of a team which had been hoping for a podium finish. Less of a problem is the sanction for the Portuguese Lola. A rear tyre blown and the car makes it back into the pits, preserving second place. There'll be duels right up till the end. The Lola of Bini Motorsports resists the attacks of the Embassy Radical. And when the latter slips into fourth place in the group, they also slip off the track a few moments later, 30 laps from the end. And the race isn't over yet. It's again Bini who attacks Bruce Juani along the rails and pushes him into a spin. It's the last incident of this race, which thus places two Belgians on the podium at home and again allows two Lolas to confirm what appears to be becoming a domination in the general classification. While the Lolas shone at spa francorchamps Silverstone sounded the hour of the Zytex that are very much at home here, and it's a newcomer in the LNT team playing on level pegging with the LMP1s at the start of the race, after having signed pole position in the category. The radical embassy also, breathing the local air, seems to be somewhat revived, and gives all its potential to rest in the top three. The arrival of Daryl Manning in the team also helps a little. For Ray Malik Limited, on the other hand, the famous British spirit doesn't help, and again the car's having its ups and downs. Coming back into the pits on three wheels, they lose all hope of victory. The Kiefel ASM Lola, it's here that they're deprived of victory, but luckily they're able to start out again and finish third. It's a turbulent time in LMP2, now with a clash between Darren Manning and Michael Verges. Car 32's been on the heels of 45, but the Peugeot of the leaders is just behind, pushing to get through. The Gulf Cytec and the 908 both slip past, one either side of car number 45, stuck in the traffic, and the Zytec flies towards victory. It's even a doubleheader for the team which places the car of Team LNT in second place, despite this contact in the last minutes with the Lola of Bini Motorsport. It's sure it's irritating. There's still battles for the places of honor between Kiefel and Horag Lolas before the retirement of the latter in the final minutes of the race. Riding Soul, it's the Barazzi Epsilon Zytec, which finally succeeds in taking its first victory of the season with one lap lead over its main adversaries, despite their proximity on the track. Whatever the case, and even if they're absent from the podium, it's Team RML and the MG Lola that take the title at the end of this race because only three LMP2s will make the final event in Brazil and will thus only score half the points normally attributed. It's a small lineup, but a major duel between the Zytec of Epsilon and the Embassy Radical, who both were going for a place in general classification right from qualifying. Unfortunately, Destiny wasn't to play their way. Pierre Bruno, Marc Rostand, and their Pillbeam will want to forget this Brazilian weekend. In the Embassy camp, they're playing on youth and experience, because as well as the usual drivers Warren Hughes and Darren Manning, it's the Brazilian Mario Haberfeld who's been brought in to reinforce at home. The trio had been leading up to this point. Eliminated by rear-end breakage, they leave the way clear for the Zytec of Verges, OJ and Barazzi to win hereafter also having had their share of bad luck.
A victory which doesn't take the championship away from RML and their drivers Newton and Erdos in the LMP2 category for this 2007 season of the Le Mans series. Aston Martin, Celine and Corvette for a three-way battle in GT1. Here again, the Le Mans series had an interesting season start, going on to have some explosive moments. In Monza, for example, the three brands present disputed pole position before it finally went to the hands of the Eureka team, and the Celine driven by Ayari and Ortelli, with the Americans still suffering from occasional reliability problems, stopping, starting again, and notably offering this duel with the Corvette of Luke Alphonse. It's one step back before finally abandoning a little later Ayari and the Selina back in their garage for the rest of the day. It's the first and last time this season. Pirouettes for the Aston Martin of Steve Zakia with half the rear end broken off. Car 51 of Labo competition won't get much further. Thanks to the retirement of the Celine of Ortelli and Iari, it's the second Aston Martin that makes its entry into the top three in GT1. That of Team Modena, running with the only woman in the pack, the American Liz Halliday. Moreover, in the Aston camp, the battle's raging between the Spanish driver Antonio Garcia and the Frenchman Christophe Bouchou, both formidable competitors in the category. Jérôme Polycon, Patrice Godard and Luc Alphon put an end to the suspense a short time after the retirement of the Céline and the team from Le Mans even realize a doubleheader thanks to the presence of the other Corvette, number 73 from Blanchiment, Dumez and Vos on the third step. Labre competition will have to be content with third place with the Aston Martin driven by Bouchou, Gardel and Golan. Between the occasional coup de grâce and the strokes of luck, both good and bad, endurance racing always sees a chain of dramas, and that which hits Luke Alfa in Valencia is a hard blow. The Celine that had slipped up in Monza picks itself back up in the worst of conditions. On a windy, narrow and tricky track, the boys of the Eureka team dust themselves off. Ahead of the Aston Martin Medina, running with Liz Halliday, but also the Spanish driver Garcia and the Brazilian Christian Fittipaldi. On the other hand, car number 51 of Lava competition has a problem, and at the same time, the second car of the team of Luke Alphon, victim to brake problems, spins, but manages to head back out without any damage. Decidedly, here the category is dominated by the Americans because there's still two Celines in the forward positions. The rear central position V8 is running very comfortably here. This second round sees the winning return of the team of Ugda Shornak with the Eureka Celine of Ayari and Ortelli, ahead of the other Celine of the Italian Racing Box team and the Aston Martin number 50 of Lava Competition, who wasn't counting so much on celebrating after a not too hot qualifying session. On the shortest and fastest track of the season, a lot of dead certains were overthrown, and others emerged from the heat haze. One thing is sure, on the podium, the boys from Celine don't hold back. Starting with a car that had a lot of potential but not too much reliability just over a year before, Areka now has a tool that goes the distance and is an equal for its rivals. An equal? More than that, in fact, because with changing pace, specifics, surface and weather, Ortelli and Iyari are always in the lead, solid and fast. In pole from qualifying, 
and in the lead from the start. The Eureka Celine has taken to open ground and has a 13 second lead over a very compact following group. The Aston Martin ahead of the second Celine, that of Team Racing Box and the Corvettes number 72 and 73 of Luke Alfa Adventures. Less than two seconds separate the four competitors. The apparently tranquil race of the leaders becomes suddenly more dramatic when the left rear tire blows and breaks the pace being imposed by Sohei Ayari. The Celine is forced to head for the pits. Nevertheless, they have time to refuel and preserve first place in GT1. Second and third steps on the GT1 podium are still swinging between the Corvette and the Aston Martin. Finally, the balance steps to the favor of Team Modena, who takes second place during a pit stop for car number 72. Discreetly, another Aston Martin slips into the fourth place, that of Bushu, Gora and Gardel, who once again are playing for places, just behind the Luc Alphon Corvette. The second consecutive win this season crowns a thousand kilometers of racing in the Eiffel Ranges for Sohei Ayari and Stefan Ortelli, and the two install themselves in the lead of the category after a dream weekend. At this point, even if the Eureka team dominated the previous two races, one couldn't say the chips are played for the whole season. We'll have to wait for the next rounds to know. Celine's once again light the fire within the GT1 pack at Spa. In any case, for Racing Box, it's a leak in the left rear end that provokes a fire in the engine compartment. The car heads for the pits and retires a little later. It's a battle between Aston Martins for 6th place, that of Team Lava number 51 leads the newcomer from the FIA GT Championship, driven by the Austrian ex-Formula 1 driver Karl Wendingler. It's the Aston of Team Medina that goes on to have an off-road experience and stays glued in place, losing precious moments and a great opportunity. Hit by a first stop and go, the Aston Martin number 50, driven by Christoph Buschu, takes advantage to refuel. The problem is that it's prohibited by the regulations and the car will have to again pass by the pit lane for a penalty. Luckily, they preserve their second place in GT1. This fourth round of the season is marked by several interventions by the safety car. And during one of these neutralizations, Luke Alphon takes the time to do some home handiwork on board the car. Its lucky mobile phones are not allowed at the wheel. It's a perfect race with no hassles from start to finish for Team Eureka, who'd taken their fourth consecutive pole on Saturday, signing the third victory in a row in Belgium. Of course, the driver and team manager are happy, as they can be. The results show because the three brands present in GT1 are also all on the podium. With Silverstone just underway, there's an explanation already underway for top places in GT1. Third place, which is being played out between Gavin, the official Chevrolet driver, and Bushu at the wheel of the Aston Martin number 50. Gavin's very much at ease, used to the sprint pace of the American events that only run three hours. The safety car is out and gives Antonio Garcia the chance to make a pit stop, abandoning his first place that he'd been hanging on to for some time. He passes the Corvette number 73 coming back out, to go into fourth place. This battle between the best Aston Martins of the pack remains constant during this British round. Maybe it's the home country air that helps. This time it's Darren Turner who ends up passing Fabrizio Gola, taking 18th place overall as well as the lead in his class. During refueling, it's the Corvette number 72 that takes back the command but has to let it slip again during a long pit stop that sets the car far behind the battle for victory. 
They've been running hot, trying to get the highest step on the podium. Car 50 of Laba competition finds itself in a gravel trap. They take minutes to get the car out, and the battle for victory is now impossible. But what happened to the Celine number 55? They have a part that came loose, and it's causing a great deal of vibration on the bodywork. Once the problem's fixed, it's another kind of vibration that emanates from the public and the Eureka pit crew. The Aston Martin of the Medina team and the Celine are in combat for the lead in GT1. Ortelli passes Turner and takes back the lead as the team watches appreciatively. On the other hand, the Aston of Christoph Buschus running slow on the track, a last minute hard blow that means they'll lose their fourth place in GT1. Things are thus harder than usual for the Team Eureka drivers. Ortelli and Ayari nevertheless make it to the top step of the podium. They have one eye on the championship, but also the pleasure of offering a small moment in history to their team, which is running its last race in the company of the Celine. Finally, in Brazil, only two cars made the trip. Among them, the Corvette of Luke Alfa Adventures, which had an old hand on board, Patrice Goslar, and two guests, Oliver Gavin and Olivier Beretta, a solid trio that on paper could only be favorites, and who lead for five and a half hours before being betrayed by a gearbox problem. Consequently, the Labo competition Aston Martin, running for Fiskin, Bervier, Zakia, and the Brazilian Fernando Reis, takes a dozen laps lead. Too much to catch back up, and it's thus the Aston Martin that takes the last event of the season. But that will not change the championship order that had been established following the Silverstone event. The Corvette of Luc Alfon gets the title of vice champion, while a Raker and their Celine are 2007 GT1 champions. A true consecration for a Yari and Ortelli who'd taken victory in England ahead of the Aston Martin of Team Modena. It is the last race of the Oreca Saline. It is definitely a very good chapter of history because uh, we started with a win uh, last year in Spa, which was our first race. Also in front of this uh, Aston Martin from Modena with Antonio Garcia at the wheel of this car. And I think it will be our last race and it was uh, made on a win again. Generally animated by the Porsche-Ferrari duel, GT2 remains one of the most hotly disputed, with an arbitrator on several occasions, the Spikers, who found a second youth at the end of the season. At Monza, on the other hand, the Italians and Germans were sole riders, sharing the honors of the battle for the lead. First, it's a Porsche of Leeds and Narak, then car number 90 of Team Fahnbacher. But quickly enough, it's the Ferraris that seem the best able to get the upper hand. They take most of the leading places, the fastest of all, number 97, driven by Hernandez, Bonetti and Di Simone. Behind Virgo Motorsport and the Scuderia Villorba, a number of places are being sorted. Finally, it's the 430 number 78, which manages to take second place. It's in GT2 as well that we have one of the biggest scares of the race at halfway point. The Porsche number 88 goes for a hard spin before being immobilized on the line of the parabolic. Luckily, the driver finally escapes from the car unscathed. The tires are also suffering. There are countless blowouts. Here it's the Spiker C8. Unfortunately for them, neither of the two cars present in Monza was in an advantageous position. 
It was finally Virgo Motorsport with Rob Bell and Alan Simonson that finally recovers third place and thus confirms the domination of Ferrari on their fetish track. In second place, Team Villoba Corse, among other things driven by the former Formula One driver Alex Caffey. The Italians thus take the first three places in the classification ahead of a Panos Esperante, which here takes its best result of the season. Luckily for the suspense, not all races are in the image of the first one, and the title holders' Porsches prepare their revenge in Valencia. On the circuit favorizing the chassis, we find the German specialists, Team Farnbacher and Felbermeyer, battling against the authors of the pole position, Raymond Narak and Richard Leitz. The Ferraris are condemned to just play second fiddle for some time. A race can finish badly on a misunderstanding, and IMSA performance pay the price for learning. It's curtains for the French team, which leaves the way clear for its adversaries. Here, the Ferrari of Bell and Simonson up against the Porsche of Pompidou and Lieb, the title holders. And the advantage goes to the Franco-German team. In their wake, it's another Porsche, that of Team Farnbacher, lying in ambush. The runners-up places remain hotly disputed. The power surge of Felbermeyer is hard to deny. The two cars won't be caught again and lead from two Ferraris, those of Virgo Motorsport and Team Villorba Corse. Despite all that, Rob Bell and Alan Simonson appear to be the strongest of the category, leading the category after two races. The Nürburgring is a hot stop for the Spikers. The C8 Spider of Yarek Yanis and Peter Cox goes up in smoke under the eyes of its driver. It's one of the most powerful and unfortunate images of this third round of the season. Right from the first minutes of the race, they're digging the gaps in GT2. The Ferrari number 96 is leading easily ahead of the Porsche of Farnbacher Racing, spotting the number 90, that of Team Felbermeyer's third, also at a distance, and the Porsche of IMSA Performance is in fourth place, and this Ferrari leading the race in the championship seems for this occasion to be totally untouchable. In third place on the podium, Dirk Werner, Pierre Erhardt and Lars Erik Nielsen again demonstrate their regularity and are among the front runners. As for the IMSA Performance team, they had for some time been targeting the podium before running into problems on the track and a long pit stop which spoils their chances. In the end, the Ferrari of Virgo Motorsport will have led virtually from start to finish and thanks to this victory, Bell and Simonson are confirmed as the strongest of the category after a promising season's beginning. The Porsche of Team Felbermeyer Proton, second in Germany, will certainly be one of the main opponents. In any case, if they were hit by hassles at the start of the season, Pompidou and Lieb seem well decided not to let their champion's crown slip away. They'll need speed, a fine strategy, just like here for Virgo who run well in all sections of the race and install themselves at the head of the championship, five points ahead of the Felbermeyer Porsche, while the Italian Ferrari of GPC Sport is in third place, having come fourth at the Nürburgring. A veritable curse hits the GT2s and particularly the Spikers in Belgium, that of Speedy Racing Team, which pays the price of an impact. At Spa, we lose count of the number of neutralizations and diverse misfortunes in the running. 
Firstly at Panos, that of Team Peninsula, which scatters body parts all over the place. Following this, and somewhat more of a problem, the Porsche of Raymond Narak comes loose against a wall. Luckily, the driver escapes uninjured. Finally, and it's without a doubt the biggest scare of the season, it's Yarek Yanis who goes off at very high speed in the Radion. The driver is concussed. The car smashed, but luckily there's no major harm done. Between the raindrops, on a track becoming increasingly tricky, Pompidou and Lieb seize the opportunity to shine and come back up on their main adversaries in the championship. They take a slight but decisive advantage over Bell and Simonson. The Porsche drivers proved yet again they were the fastest on this circuit in qualifying. The Ferraris will have to follow. And after the pit stops, as the rain comes in scattered showers over the Belgian Ardennes, it's again the boys in blue who take back the advantage thanks to an overtaking maneuver with no discussion possible. Ferrari and Porsche are neck and neck, and for the moment, while the Italians started the season well, the Germans are back in form. The F430 of Team GPC following the car of Virgo Motorsport may finish third, but had no chance of facing up to the day's victors, who are back in reach of the championship title. At Silverstone, the Felbermeyer boys are quick to be disenchanted. Robert Bell, without Alan Simonson, retained at another event, is already alone in the lead of GT2. And not the least bit disturbed. He's taking almost half a second per lap on his adversaries. The IMSA Performance Porsche is second in GT2, in for a pit stop, while the Virgo Motorsport Ferrari prances with two laps lead. Less at ease than usual here, the Felbermeyer Porsche of the title holders Lieb and Pompidou little by little comes back up to the third place in the group. The suspense is up, half the rear ends torn off and they're into the pits retiring from the race and renouncing the title. There's just one man in the lead who we already know will be champion. Robert Bell snatches the crown after having led in qualifying and the race but not without a little thought for his usual teammate Simonson. In the back of your mind, you, 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 you try to black, you know, not think about it, but you do. So when the Porsche stopped, we knew what it could mean, but there was still 35 minutes of the race to go, so we didn't get excited. But uh, when the Porsche went, sorry, when we finished, we knew we'd won the championship. And uh, obviously, it's my championship alone, which is a bit of a shame because Alan Simonson's done a really good job this year, the same as I have. Uh, so it's a little bit of a shame, but. Uh, but it's nice also for myself, you know. Rob Bell crowned in GT2. There remains to be decided the other places on the podium in the final event of the season on the other side of the Atlantic. It's moreover the GT2 contingent that was the best represented at Interlagos, with no less than 13 cars at the start reinforced by the presence of a home team and several Brazilian drivers with their sights set on getting a result on home ground. It was the old hands at making it to the top step of the podium that shone the most during the nine hours of racing. Mark Lieb and Xavier Pompidou didn't leave anyone else the chance to conclude the season in style. At one point, another Porsche, number 95 of James Watt Automotive, looked like playing for the victory and allowing one of its drivers, Alan Simonson, to also take the championship crown. There was also Team Farnbacher, always well placed, starting from pole position, but the German had to fold under the assaults of the Ferrari of Team JMB. 
The three cars of the French formation are very well classified. Number 99 with Philip Peter, Ben Orcott and Rob Bell, the title holder in third place. In fact, the second place goes to the Ferrari 430 driven by the Brazilian team formed by the Negreo family and Andreas Mateus. Since the green light, car number 75 is constantly in the top five. On the steps of the podium, finally to confirm the progression of the Spiker, it's car number 84 of Mike Hesemann's Peter Cox and Paul van der Spluteren, which finishes in fourth position. After more than 1,500 kilometers racing, it's thus the Porsche of Xavier Pompidou, Marc Lieb and Marc Basseng victorious after prancing in the lead for a number of hours. A victory which confirms second position for the German team in the championship behind the Ferrari 430 of Vogo Motorsport. The Ferrari of GPC Sport also present in Brazil but very unlucky finishes in third place.